Okay, we are officially starting Unit 2, and Unit 2 is going to start um, with Modules 2.3 and 2.5. We're going to focus in this video lecture on the memory systems. So what is the process of getting information from the outside world into our brain? What do we do when we get it in there? Where does it go? How do we eventually get it back? And so our focus today is going to be on the overarching principles of what happens um, in this memory system process. So to begin with, when we're talking about processing, we're talking about what's called the information processing model. So essentially what we do to get information from the outside world in and stored and brought back out is kind of a three-step process. It's encoding, storage, and retrieval. So encoding is the act of getting it in there and hopefully getting it to stay. Storage is the act of once we get it in there, putting it somewhere to kind of stay until we are ready to then actively get it out of that storage area and use that information. So we do this three-step process in getting all information into our brain, into our long-term storage and back out to use it. So we are going to get more in depth throughout this unit on what are ways in which we can better encode, better get information into our brain, storage in what way or what areas or what types of storage do we have in our memory system, and then retrieval. What impacts our ability to get the information out? How reliable is that information that comes out from our long-term memory? Um, and are there ways to um, improve it? And what are some of the negatives that come from um, individuals who do not have a good retrieval system. So in this video, we're going to talk about kind of two different um, models. The first one is the three-stage multi-storage model. And this was the original model that was created um, and for the longest time was the only model we had. Um, in this model, it looks at this system as kind of three different types of memory. We have our sensory memory, which is for our five senses. This is where we just originally get information in. We then have our short-term memory, which is kind of the memory that we are utilizing at the moment. And then we have our long-term memory, which is our storage of that information um, that hopefully gets encoded to that area of our life. So we're gonna talk through those three different types of model in this three-stage multi-storage model system. So the first thing is our sensory memory. Sensory memory is like the last slide showed, all five of our senses. So this is fleeting, this is split second, this is all the information that bombards us constantly throughout the day, the things that we see, smell, touch, feel, taste. Um, this is that information that's all around us. We have lots and lots and lots of information that's coming in through our sensory memory. Um, this is usually split second, and it's only things that we pay attention to that kind of get to move to the next um, step in the memory process, which is the short-term memory. Sensory memory is broken down into two kind of specific types, which are our echoic memory, which is memory for um, things that we hear, and iconic memory, which is memory for things that we see. Again, this memory system is very split second. It's very short. Um, so the echoic memory is memory for things that we um, hear. The duration of this is only about four seconds long. And iconic memory is only about one second long. So when we talk about this, I mean that we have things that are coming in. We're hearing things all the time. If we don't choose to pay attention to the things that we hear, it leaves us. The things that we pay attention to go into our short-term memory. Well, we do have an ability to access about three to four seconds of um, hearing information that happened earlier that we don't pay attention to. So think about if you are a student in class and you are daydreaming or doing something you shouldn't be doing and the teacher says, hey, Johnny, what did I just say? You're able to use your echoic memory to go back about four seconds to be able to then repeat to that teacher what they just said to try and prove that you were actually listening. You're able to then kind of re-get that information and then now you've paid attention to it so it's moving into your short-term memory. If we don't try and access that, it's gone. It's fleeting. It's in one ear and out the other. Similar process happens for iconic things that we see, although this is a shorter 
um, storage and capability. The duration is only about one second, meaning we can see a visual picture of something. And as it goes away, if we didn't pay attention to it, that information is gone, but we can access about one second earlier for things that we see. So we can, uh, maybe a picture is, or a phone number is flashed on a screen. It goes away for a second, we can almost still see and go back to and access that visual information, maybe those numbers. Uh, maybe it's a picture and it, that picture goes away and somebody um, asks you a quick question about it. You can almost see for a split second that picture that just exited off the screen. So although our sensory memory is that split second duration for all of our senses, those two specific types, echoic and iconic, um, are more specific as far as their duration, how long hearing and vision stays with us. The second part of this three system process, this three storage model is our short term memory. This is the information that we pay attention to from our sensory memory. It moves into our short term memory. And this is kind of what we are using at any particular period of time. In that it kind of has what we call the magic number seven where the capacity of our short-term memory is um, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. Um, so you might think about the fact that there are kind of the seven wonders of the world, the seven C's, the seven deadly sins, phone numbers are seven digits. This magic seven is the reason why there's a, there's a lot of things that we do with this number seven, because we know that the capacity of what we are working on at the moment, our short-term memory, is seven plus or minus two pieces of information. So we are likely to remember on average seven numbers in when we are given those seven individual phone, uh, numbers. So this kind of short-term working memory has a larger capacity than our sensory memory. Um, it lasts a little bit longer. And um, you know that kind of magic seven is really important for that capacity of that short-term memory. Well, then what happens is information that we um, encode, information that we, and we, again, we'll talk in few, for further modules on how do we encode, how do we get that information fast, but um, information that we encode, we memorize, goes to our long-term memory. And our long-term memory has um, two overarching types. The two overarching types are implicit and explicit. So first, we're going to talk about implicit long-term memories. So these are a type of memory, of long-term memory that are stored in part in our cerebellum. Remember, it's that little tiny brain on the bottom back of our brain, the top of the brain stem, the back of the occipital lobe. That's where we find that implicit memories are mainly stored. And these are memories for things like tasks, skills, habits, um, automatic associations or feelings we have about people when we meet them or when we see them um, later. These are types of memories that we don't even have to think about. These types of memories are automatic. Um, a particular type of implicit memory is called a procedural memory. And these are very skill-based, something like riding a bike, playing an instrument, um, building a chair, if you've put together chairs before. Um, these are uh, driving a car is an example of a procedural memory. So although these weren't originally something that we could quickly and easily do, once we've learned that task or that skill, it becomes an implicit memory. It becomes a skill-based memory where we are just able to do that without even having to be consciously aware um, of how to do that. Typically, when we see individuals with um, long-term memory loss, these implicit memories are the ones that stay with us far longer than the other type, which is explicit that we're going to talk about in the next slide. So the other type of long-term memory are explicit memories. I remember this by taking the EX from explicit and thinking about like experiences. Explicit memories are um, those memories that kind of we don't want to lose. These are mainly stored in our hippocampus. And um, these types of memories um, range from multiple different types. We have semantic and episodic. Um, we have different types of episodic, the flashbulb, autobiographical, and prospective memory. Um, but explicit memory in general um, 
big picture are kind of like experiences and knowledge and information that we have gathered throughout our life. So one type of explicit long-term memory is semantic. This is for things like facts and general knowledge. This is like knowing um, what year Freud was born or knowing what year your brother or sister was born um, or general knowledge as far as like what are different kinds of breeds of dogs. Um, so semantic is those long-term memories for facts, general knowledge, things that we've learned um, throughout our life. Again, these are explicit memories. They are stored in the hippocampus. Um, then we also have episodic, which are experiences and events. These are what makes our life rich and worth living. So episodic is kind of the category for all events in our life that we have um, put into our long-term memory. One type of episodic memory is something called autobiographical memory. And these are for specific life events or experiences that hold personal significance to you. So that's why you see the picture in the center here of like somebody's family photos, right? Those are examples of autobiographical memories. Those are about specific life events that you experienced. So maybe um, you can see here, like when you went to school and um, where you came from and, um, Ex, you know, experiences with your family on vacation. We have these autobiographical memories of who we are, where we came from, the specific life events or experiences that we had that really have high personal significance to us. Another type is called a flashball memory. And flashball memories are almost as if like a flash of light or a camera went off at one particular moment it's a clear memory of some sort of emotionally significant event. So um, a lot of times like 9-11 is considered a flashbulb like memory that's universal that we all experience or um, the death of Princess Diana, another flashbulb memory, something that it's almost as if the flash of a camera went off at that exact event and we seem to remember it and be able to put ourselves back in that position. And we feel like we know every single detail and experience and piece of that particular event. We can remember exactly where we were, who we were talking to, um, what we were feeling, maybe what was happening in the environment, what we were wearing. We remember every single fact as if a flash of a camera went off. What makes these so significant and different from other types of um, explicit memories is that they have um, activation of the amygdala which kind of enhances them and makes them stand out as their own particular memory. Um, as we know, the amygdala is responsible for regulating our emotions. So when our amygdala is activated in highly emotional events, such as 9-11, such as the day, we were, uh, the day we gave birth to a child or the moment we got married, those particularly emotionally significant events activate the amygdala and what it does is it strengthens these memories and gives them what we call that flashbulb-like quality. The final type of episodic memory, which are examples of explicit memory, is called prospective memory. And this is memory for remembering future events rather than past events. While flashbulb and autobiographical remember the past, prospective is remembering the future. So this is um, our ability to remember our delayed intentions, that we need to attend a meeting next week. Remember that we need to leave at three o'clock for an appointment. Oh, remember I need to go get a gift for a friend or I need to complete that module for class. This is our memory for the future. Again, it's still considered an ex explicit memory. It's still an episodic form of explicit memory because it's an experience, uh, but it's remembering future experiences or future things that we need to do. So those are kind of the three steps of the three-stage multi-storage process. The second model is kind of the new updated model that we have today, um, which has one important change to this three-step memory process. So we see in this picture that sensory memory is still there, long-term memory is still there, but instead of working or instead of um, short-term memory, we have something called working memory. Um, that working memory kind of relies on something called a central executive. So this new memory model 
says that we don't have a short-term memory, but rather we have what's called a working memory, or we have a central executive that's kind of in charge of our memory system. And this central executive is somebody who is both taking information from the sensory memory, but also pulling information from our long-term memory, also taking information from the world around us, kind of combining those and allowing us to work with and um, interact with the information that it, we are paying attention to. So in the earlier belief was that the short-term memory had a capacity of seven plus or minus two pieces of information, that magical number seven. This memory model says that our working memory kind of has a varying capacity kind of based on our age and the amount of information we were trying to manipulate at the time. It's not really a set number. Um, we can think about this as like a scratch pad. It's kind of like where our brain processes important information. It's where our memory is for information we are currently working on. It's a place where our short-term and long-term memories kind of come together and we manipulate, we change, we utilize um, that information. So our working memory is where we kind of have our focused attention at the moment. So think about that selective attention that we learned during sensation and perception. Whatever we choose to pay attention to, um, that focusing and filtering, whatever we're focusing on, that's what our current working memory is doing. So if we don't focus on information, then that information kind of goes away, goes by the wayside, either goes back to the long-term memory because it was stored before, or it is gone forever. It escapes. It's forgotten about. So within this working model, this working memory central executive idea, um, there are um, kind of two different things that they think that central executive is doing. And that central executive is both using what's called a phonological loop and a visuospatial sketch pad. So the phonological loop is where we hold auditory information in our working and short-term memory. So think about when you're repeating a, a friend's phone number over and over again in your brain before you um, put it, before you have a chance to pick up your phone and put it into your phone, you're using your phonological loop, right? You're repeating information over and over and over again. That phonological loop is the responsibility of our central executive. We need that working memory and central executive to be able to repeat that information over and over and over in a circle um, in order to either hopefully move it to our long-term memory or if we get it into our phone, then we can let that information go. That central executive is also using what's called the visuospatial sketch pad. Um, this is what we do to hold information about objects in relations to space. Um, this is your ability to know where things are located. Um, so your ability to um, visualize where your car is parked outside in the parking lot um, when you're at the movies. It's our ability to take a look at this picture on the slide and be able to look away and still remember um, and visualize where was the camera. The camera was in the bottom left corner or the, um, the paint and paint brushes was in the bottom right corner. Our visuospatial sketch pad, our central executive is using that visuospatial sketch pad to kind of memorize and focus on where are things in visual proximity. Um, so we repeat information, we tell stories, we make visual pictures of locations. We do kind of all these things with our central executive. And so we are maybe taking long-term memory, combining it with new information that's coming in. We put those two things together. We make pictures, we repeat information, and we do all that with that central um, executive in our brain. So those are the two working models that we have for today, the three stage, as well as the working memory model. Um, we will process and practice with this in class.